Left in Kentucky, the podcast of Indivisible Northern Kentucky. Hello, everybody. Hi. We are back for episode two of Left in Kentucky. Seems like only yesterday. I know. It does. Seems like only yesterday. How you doing today, Amy? <laughs> I could be a lot worse. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Something It's good... kind of a dreary day, but it's, it's a dreary day, but something good did happen this week. You know, I seem to recall that. Yeah, there was something good. Hmm. It felt well, like a like a stone had been lifted from my heart. It Pretty felt much. it felt like a cankerous tumor had been removed from my anus. Yes. Well, I don't know if I can imagine that, but <laughs> the stone was pretty heavy. Yeah. And it's orange, like I'd been holding very my orange. breath for, you know, four and a half years. Yeah. So, uh, so clearly the inauguration Wednesday of President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. Yay. And Vice President Kamala better, yay. Debbie Harris. So very exciting. I, uh, I have to, you know, I have to confess, um, you know, when we were stuck with whatever, 14 different Democratic nominees, um, there were very few that I just <laughs> like said, no, no way, you know, Bluebird. <laughs> but um <laughs> You know, she always really impressed me. Uh, she was in my top five, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I was. I supported her for. I, I was. I was really hoping her for president for the presidential nomination, back when she was running. So very happy to see her get the vice president. And you know, let's see how she does. But you know, I think she's going to prove um, that she'll be more than a competent president. She'd be a, a very good president. So. I think so too. And Joe's definitely gotten to work right away. So I know one of my, one of my concerns was, were we going to, you know, were we going to see what happened with uh, Obama when he started, he was so focused on trying to build a coalition right. that he let a lot of time burn before he started doing things. Right. And, and, you know, Joe's got the capital now he needs to really pounce on it. Yeah. Um, in my opinion. Yep, and he uh, seems to be doing a good job of that. So. I have no complaints so far. Yeah, um, very so. excited. So, and here in Kentucky, we have our usual Yay. fun stuff. Well, we have an awesome governor. Uh, we have an amazing oh, wow. governor. Who is, uh, did you hear he got picked to, um, to head the, they're doing a um, governor's committee. Economic. Yeah, on economic yeah. recovery from COVID nineteen. Right, um, it's so great. You know, I, I don't want to lose him <laughs> as our governor, <laughs> but I could sure see him doing something. You know, um, national. Yeah, I could definitely um, see him moving on to a national position in the future. But uh, right but now, he's got to he better stay, stay here. here. <laughs> yes, because <he> <laughs> we're still in this together. We are in it together. He's he's in it with us. That's for sure. And I feel that every time I see him speak, I, I, you know, there's some things that you just can't fake. And, you know, that guy cares. You can say whatever you want to about him or his views on things. And I don't agree with him on everything. I'll, I'll be honest. But the man cares about us. You can just tell. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of caring, our, our uh, thoughts go out to um, to our own Miss Ann Dickerson, who is yep. uh, still feeling poorly, and uh, we hope that she is on the mend quickly. Yes, we miss her, and uh, we wish her the best. So everybody out there, uh, send your positive energy, thoughts, prayers, whatever you whatever you do. Whatever voodoo you do, uh, your voodoo dance, send those positive things Anne's way, and and hopefully she'll be with us again in the near future. I'm hoping. Yep. Um, but because it is funnier with Anne, it is. I mean, you know, we're we're witty, but she's funny. 
Um, so speaking of funny, cow patties. I saw some real ones today. Did you? Oh yeah, I guess you did out on the farm. Mm. So yeah, I don't, we, I don't go out in the field every day. Um, that's my, that's my husband's job. But yeah, we should do, we should do a farm special one of these days in the sure. after times. We should, we should. I, go I'm all about it. Do a tour of the farm. Yeah. So we'll see about that. That could be a fun we time. Can get bark, Rocky to bark for us. There you go. That's easy. I love Rocky. <laughs> um, He's so, an idiot, but yeah. Yep. Yeah. So speaking of idiots, mm, who's your cow patty? Great segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you what my cow patty is this week. And, you know, I really did think that I would, you know, mix it up. Find some new uh, worthy recipient of this award. How'd that work out for you? Well, you know, it just <laughs> comes back to Rand Paul. And y'all, it's not because he's running next year that I'm targeting him, although we should. But it's because he's doing it to himself. Um, you got to wonder some of the stunts he's pulling. Uh, oh. Like that. Whether... <laughs> whether he's uh really trying to get that uh trumpian crowd on his side and how that's going to work out for him because he's still all about defending the president and defending this big huge lie that the former president um is saying and has been saying that the election was stolen from him um and you know and, and Rand just can't admit that that is a lie so um he's a liar he's unpatriotic uh he does not believe in our democracy um he's also apparently very racist um uh, just you know not based on past but based on present you know he's talking about wait wait i i I thought it was i thought it was biden that hate black teenagers because he's pushing for minimum wage (laughs) exactly (laughs) he seems to think that a 15 dollars minimum wage well that's racist because it'll hurt black teenagers really (laughs) rand what world do you live in really you know we run a, a farm business and we don't make a lot of money but by gosh we make sure we pay our workers 15 dollars an hour minimum you know, yep. and if our business can do it, any business can do it and survive. Um, that's just a fact. So um, he's wrong. Um, and maybe he should focus on, you know, job creation for those demographic than if he's so worried about them losing all their jobs. Um, I don't I don't really get. Unless it's just a dog whistling. Um, then there was why he's got the stance. Then there was this great performance on uh, this week with uh, this week with George Stephanopoulos on Sunday morning. It makes you embarrassed to be in a Kentuckian. (laughs) It does. It does. So step in it, Rand. Yep. Well deserved there. I think well deserved. Uh, so what do you have for us this week. My cow patty goes to uh, Kentucky's Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Oh, Ooh, Danny boy! Oh. Uh, there's so many things to pick for, pick him for, but uh, this one has to do with the Breonna Taylor case, and um, and uh, there is a newly filed. Uh, um, petition to impeach Daniel Cameron that has been filed by members of the grand jury in the Breonna Taylor case. Well, that gives it some weight for sure. So, so this, I'm actually going to say this is a double. This is a cow patty for uh, Cameron. Oh. One for you. And for the jurors who brought the petition. Yes. 
it's a bullhorn. So this yes. is a two and one. Um, and what the what these grand jurors are alleging is that um, he uh, Cameron breached public trust and failed to comply with his duties by misrepresenting the findings of the grand jury. He did. Yeah. Um, apparently, initially, he told members of the grand jury that they would be able to um, consider um, murder charges after after considering the initial charges that were brought up. And then they were only allowed to consider the initial charges and the other was never was never brought up. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a snake in the grass. Yeah. Um, so this now becomes the third petition for uh, impeachment so far since the uh, since the state legislative uh, majority party has decided that all petitions for uh, for impeachment need to be considered by committee. Um, Representative Robert Goforth was uh criminal yeah uh has articles or has a petition for impeachment that's being considered by the uh impeachment committee um that's um chaired by uh neems jason neems and uh, they expect this petition for daniel cameron's impeachment to also go before that committee Sorry, Chewbacca. <laughs> Chewbacca didn't like that one either. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, we couldn't see this coming. And with, with the state legislature now taking these, um, these petitions from citizens for impeachment to seriously to the point of having a committee I think we are going to see a floodgate open. Yep. And I know is, I'm, I'm considering one myself, huh? Yeah. And what's already a dysfunctional state legislature will slide further into the abyss. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, you know what, guys, that means that we need to replace all those guys. And that happens next year. That's right. So we got uh, 2021 is an off year. Everybody gets to breathe. And then 2022, all of the representatives are up for election again. And, uh, and half of the uh, state Senate is up for election. So start, uh, start putting your, your card together of, of who you need to vote out to so we can actually get some work done in the state be nice to actually instead of playing all these games and power games um to actually get some legislation passed that helps people of kentucky that'd be so nice that would be amazing i i, I don't know what i'd do with myself i know what would we talk about i'm sure so i'd find start something. <laughs> you know i'd start uh sharing some of my uh my husband's recipes because uh, i was gonna say, i was waiting for you to say you were going to share your recipes i was gonna go uh i would not lie <laughs> you really don't you I think mean, we've suffered enough <laughs> <laughs> hey what i can manage to make is pretty decent but yeah the, just the list is very short this week we have an extra special gift, not just one guest on our show, but we have two guests. I know, totally crazy for us, but it's very exciting. It's 2021. We're doing new things. So, uh, so joining us this week, um, we have Kaylin Glover, who is president of Kentuckians for Science Education. Uh, she has a PhD in biology and has a lot of experience working with different policymakers and religious leaders and, um, and a public advocate for science and education. And also joining us, we have Trent Garrison, who is president of the Kentucky Academy of Science. Uh, Trent is, um, is a, also has a PhD. His is in environmental geology, if, if I remember right. Um, right. 
I knew it was geology. I thought it was environmental geology. Um, he's president of KAS, and um, he is also the liaison with Kentuckians for Science Education. So welcome to our show. Thank you. We're glad to be here. Thanks. And for the record, I don't actually have my PhD yet. I am still in works, should be done soon, but graduate education is its own special place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been in grad school. I know the pains thereof. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's great. Yeah. So, Kaylin, uh, why don't we start off with you? Why don't you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and about Kentuckians for Science Education? Sure. So I am a transplant to Kentucky. I'm originally from Arkansas, and I went into science education because I had a really influential and awesome biology teacher. And I was like, I want to do that for someone else. And so I went and uh, I, I taught for a little bit, but then I, I realized that I just really wanted a larger classroom. Uh, I just, just teaching, just teaching my class, my, my, you know, some, uh, several hundred kids was just not enough. <laughs> uh, so I went and uh, got my master's and then I started teaching at Arkansas State University along with um, advising students and and that helped. Um, I got involved in the, um, well, I, I actually, I started giving a lecture to my students because they would come to my office and would ask for help because they were really struggling with learning about evolution um, and what they had been told about evolution in their churches and from their families. And they were having faith crises. And so, at the time, I was a really religious person, and I had worked through a lot of those um, issues myself. And so I uh, gave, started giving an extra lecture for just anybody who wanted to attend on evolution and creationism um, and ended up getting really popular. <laughs> um, I was giving it six times over a two-week period wow. to rooms of you know, 100 to 150. Um, a local pastor attended. Um, I ended up starting, we, we co-hosted a radio program after that on science and religion and politics. And, um, and then I started working with the local ministry alliance. And um, so that was like me getting my big, like, th this is the classroom I want, right? Like, I want to work with the people. And I realized that in order to be taken seriously, especially as a woman in science, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have a PhD, well, see you later. Yeah. Uh, so I, I decided to pursue my PhD, picking up projects that I had started off in my master's in order to continue that kind of work. Okay. So cool. that's my backstory. Uh, and Kentucky and Sir Science Education is, is just a great extension of that. I get to do science advocacy. I get to work with the public. I get to focus on the importance of learning about science. And so um, we, uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit in terms of like watching what's going on at the state legislature and responding to any attempts to undermine um, the teaching of science. Um, but we also are engaging in several other projects where we're going to be um, reaching out to the community and uh, working with faith leaders, um, building bridges between other communities uh, so that uh, at a grassroots level, they understand that science is not antithetical to your religious beliefs, um, as long as there's some degree of flexibility in those. You know, if, right. if you're a complete biblical literalist, we might have some issues. But uh, for the most part, there's ways to reconcile that. And unfortunately, that's not the picture that is portrayed. And so um, our big effort, our big goal is to sort of help the the acceptance and understanding of science um, at the level of people, not scientists, not necessarily kids in a classroom, but everyday people and um, recognize that they can they can love science, they can be interested in science um, and they don't necessarily hate science, even though we often view people who might vote a certain way as being anti-science. Um, and so by, by helping them reconcile those ideologi ideological conflicts, mm -hmm. um, we can do a lot more good than just, you know, saying, y'all don't know science. I think that's great. You know, especially right now, we're hearing a lot of people talking about, you know, it's, it's how do we bring people together? It's been so divisive over the past, you know, 
four years or so, or even longer <laughs> than that, you know, I mean, um, the, the parties have been getting, um, not the parties, but just people have been getting more and more divided rather than coming together. And I think having this push of, Hey, you know, science and faith, are not mutually exclusive things. You can have both. Um, I have a very good friend of mine who uh, is a um, biologist uh, by training, and he's been a, an Episcopal priest now for 25 years. And uh, he, he has the same thing. He has uh, uh, weekly meetings at his parish with folks to talk about science and faith and bringing those together and how they aren't mutually exclusive uh, ideas. Right. And in the state of Kentucky, you know, there's a lot of people that are deeply religious in our state. And uh, faith is very important to the majority of people in the state. So um, it can't be dismissed. It can't be, you know, talked down on um, if we really want people um, to embrace, you know, different points of view or uh, think about things maybe differently than they did before. Yeah. And I think um, it's it's really easy to just be like, well, just accept the science, right? This is what the facts say. Um, but cognitive dissonance is real. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not that easy. Um, and whenever you've shaped your entire uh, world view around a particular set of religious beliefs, and then you start realizing that maybe some of those aren't exactly what had been presented, then you start questioning all of them, right? Which, which some people would say is a good thing. And I would venture to say that questioning everything you believe is, should be something done on a regular basis. Um, but it can be very threatening. Um, the decisions you make, the sacrifices you've made, the, the uh, you know, like the medis medical care that you get, um, whether or not you are taking care of your kids as well as they could be, all of these decisions, um, threaten you as like a parent and as a person. If if I'm wrong on this, that means that I have hurt people and that I have, have made decisions that are irrevocable. Um, and that is so hard. And so if we're not creating a space where people can, can shift, not just their beliefs about science, but their beliefs about themselves, then we're not going to get people to support science because at least not in the way that it deserves to be supported. Um, and so that's, that's on us. That's on, uh, that's the responsibility of everybody who's trying to, to do science and work with the public. Um, and the scientists I know will be like, well, my job's in the lab. And I'm like, I don't care where you think your job is. <laughs> the people are the ones that are funding your research. Exactly. They're the ones who are going to be benefiting from your research. You are not isolated. Get out there and work with them. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point um, that, it, you know, it, the funding comes from the public. And if the public doesn't have an understanding or an appreciation for the importance of the science and what that means to them, they're not going to support the funding that you need to do that research. Exactly. And you talked about the divide that's politically happening. It's largely happening along rural and urban lines. Um, and that's in large part due to distrust of urban centers academia and, and whatnot. And when it comes to um, funding universities um, across the nation for the last 15 plus or so years, the funding for universities, actually it's been probably closer to 20 or 25, the funding for, for states um, to their public universities has been declining um, because they know that the public, the, a lot of state legislatures lean more red based on how the composition works out. And they know the public doesn't, isn't exactly entirely supportive of it. So they keep, you know, cutting funding for it. Um, and that's why we've ended up with the model of uh, education as it is, that's heavily dependent on students and heavily dependent on student loans, that's driving all sorts of other problems. But it's this divide, this distrust, this, um, elitist mentality to some degree that's that's the root of the problem mm -hmm. so uh so let's switch over to trent and let's talk about the uh, kentucky academy of sciences so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about kentucky academy of sciences and then we'll kind of bring it together and see how this all fits together okay sounds good well first of all i appreciate you having me on, one of the things that I'm passionate about is communication in science. And as you can see, Kaylin does a really good job of that. 
Um, I agree with everything she said, and I'm I'm glad she's in that position in KSC because she's hit the ground running <laughs> there. <laughs> I am from uh, southeastern Kentucky, uh, just outside of Hyden, if anybody knows where that is. And um, I, I, I just grew up around mountains and landslides and um, j- j- rock, different rock types of rock formations and that sort of thing. And I think that kind of shaped uh, what I wanted to go into when I went to college. So uh, I ended up going to Eastern Kentucky University for my bachelor's and master's in, um, in geology. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I, I thought I wanted to be a meteorologist, but I uh, ended up going into geology. I had some uh, some neat uh, eccentric figures in my uh, <laughs> as college professor. So, so I went into that and um, also was interested in policy along the way, uh, which we, we can talk about that more later. But, um, but all these roads kind of led me to Kentucky Academy of Science. I've been a member for a long time and um, I'm president now this year. It's kind of a long process, but but KES is a, a very, it's a large statewide interdisciplinary science organization that has, I'm not sure what the latest numbers are as far as membership goes, but it's uh, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 4,500 members. That's anything from uh, academics to students to scientists in the private and public sector and just people interested in science in general. And it started in 1914 where a group of scientists and just you know, science interested people got together and started one of the early science organizations in the state. We just had our 100 year anniversary not too, not too many years ago. So that was that was really neat. I remember, you know, all that happening. I think that was uh, back in 2014 was when the 100 year anniversary was. So, so that's a that's a pretty big deal. Uh, KES is an affiliate of uh, many people I think are familiar with AAAS, AAAS, some people call it American Association Association for the Advancement of Science. Mm -hmm. And it's also an affiliate of the National Association of Academies of Science, which our executive director, Amanda Fuller, is the incoming president. So that's pretty cool. Um, Our the the KS mission is basically to foster scientific discovery and understanding in Kentucky. So it can be, you know, it really it really can be anybody who's interested in science. Historically, it's been based, a lot of our membership has been college professors and, you know, students and graduate students doing poster presentations present at the Capitol, you know, applying for funding. Uh, we have a, our own journal and all that stuff. But uh, what we've been really trying to do, and I, I myself have been pushing it uh, really hard, is to get it, get the word out there and do more types of things like this so the public knows about it, knows about these organizations. So more people can be involved. You know, you don't have to be an academic. Uh, You don't have to be a student necessarily. You know, it's cheaper dues if you're a student. It's like five (laughs) bucks or something, but, uh, but you, you know, anybody can join. And that's what, uh, that's one of my main missions as a part of KES is to, uh, you know, get the word out there, say anybody can join, do public outreach, because I think as scientists, we don't do enough of that. Uh, so, so here we are. Uh, there's plenty of more things as far as what KES actually does. We, you know, we we have grants. We do out, outreach. We have the Journal of the Academy of Science. We have the we host the Junior Academy. Uh, we have an annual meeting each fall. Our keynote speaker this past year was Dr. Stack and um, Dr. Atchison. They, you know, had some really good speakers that year. Our upcoming meeting. This year will be at Eastern Kentucky University. We have a speakers bureau in which scientists in our organization sign up, and if the public needs a specialist uh, on, you know, sinkholes, let's say, just a random thing, or bats, you know, you can have a geologist or a biologist come out and speak, or in, in today's world, it would be a, a Zoom. That's called the Kentucky Science Speakers Bureau. And uh, we, we are also kind of an affiliate of sorts with the, uh, the radio show Bench Talk This Week in Science that's hosted by Dr. Dave Robinson at Bellarmine University. So uh, it's really cool to be, uh, I've been a part of that several times. And uh, we also follow legislation as does um, KSC. So we work together closely on that. Uh, there are lots of other things, but I'll stop there. That's good. Thanks for, uh, you know, that, that brings it really nicely together. And um and so let's uh, let's kind of dig into that now and start talking about some of the issues that are before uh, before the state house the house this year. I think as our listeners are probably are aware, we're in the um, we're in the break in our thirty day session this year. This is the short year with the thirty day session. Um, and legislators will be coming back and uh, not this week but the following week. 
So what are some of the issues that are before the house and, and that you think people should definitely be aware of? And, and perhaps if they want to get involved, how they can, you know, get involved and help out with the cause. Yeah. So if you, so on our website, KAS, we have a committee and uh, KSE the same way, but we, we have a committee that reviews bills. And as you probably all know, reviewing bills, even in a 30 day session that we're in right now is a laborious task. Oh, yeah. And out of the, I don't know, 500 or some bills that we have, we've tried to go through as many as we, as we can at this point. And, and KES has a page. If you go to the homepage and click under uh, about and advocate for science, Amanda just posted the, uh, our reviews of the bills. So there are some education related bills, some vaccination related, energy and environment related, public health related, and just a whole host of others. Uh, I won't go through all those because there are quite a few, there's probably a hundred or so on the, on our page. But if you want to, if anybody out there listening wants to go and see what, uh, you know, the largest science organization in the state thinks about certain bills, um, you can go to our website and, and find that out. For example, you know, if I'm, I, I find this helpful because if I'm, you know, I want to know something about uh, education related bills in general, I can go to KEA's website and they have the same thing or, you know, I you name a bunch of other websites because it's hard to, you know, hear a bill. And there's just so many of them try to figure out which ones are you for, which ones are you against. So when a big organization like KES, you know, has reviewed these bills and looks at it from the standpoint of, you know, is this good for, science in Kentucky and it has the weight of KES behind it, you can, I, I think you can feel pretty good about um, your support or opposition or just, you know, is it a, just a simply a bill to watch at this time? So we do have a, we do have a website for that. Again, it's under, if you go to the homepage and you click under uh, about and then click on advocate for science, you can see the, um, the bills that we've supported and opposed and such. And we just we, add call your legislators. Yes, if you if you like something, call them. If you don't like something, call them as well. What what, what I've heard a lot of people say, we've had some legislators on our on, on my program, and uh, they they like to hear things that you are for, not just things you're against. You know, it's good to to establish that that relationship with them uh, and, and instead of just calling and saying you're against everything. So we try to do that. Mm -hmm. And we will put the links to both uh, KSE and uh, KAS on our on the information for the podcast. So if you're listening to the podcast, you can look at the information and those websites will be on there. Um, so as I was looking through the bills and and uh, and whatnot, you know, I noticed House Bill One is on the list under public health. Um, and that's the one that allows businesses and institutions to reopen if they're complying with CDC guidelines. Um, however, uh, in this bill, there's no way, there's no accountability for it. It's, it's like, uh, well, if you say you're doing it, we trust you're doing it. Right. Yeah. And we, we oppose that one for that reason. Yeah. Um, House Bill 10, and I picked the low numbers because I think it's, again, as our listeners know, the bills with low numbers, those tend to be the ones that the uh, majority feels are higher priority, the ones that they're uh, really pushing. Um, House Bill 10 is is immunity from civil liability for businesses during the COVID emergency. There are a variety there are a variety of bills like that and anti-vaccination bills and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, the anti-vaccination bill, that one just floored me. I, I couldn't even believe that was introduced. Yeah. Fluoride too. That's a, that's a recurring one. Um, oh yeah. The, try to, so that cities don't have to put fluoride in the water if they don't want to. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause clearly that has not been helpful for, for the people in our country having fluoride <laughs> in the water. <laughs> right. That's HB 159 and SB 109 allows local government entities to avoid implementation of water fluoridization. Um, on the support side, are there any that are, I guess, particularly of interest to either one of you or near and dear to your heart? 
Well, um, Kaylin, do you have any while I look through these? <laughs> Isn't there one um, to cap the cost of insulin? Yes, yes, we, we, we're in support of that. Basically anything that, that we feel that helps the citizens of Kentucky. Um, it's, it's difficult. I was looking through HB 242, prohibits local governments and colleges from adopting sanctuary policies. We, it, it's kind of tough when you're going through these bills and you, know, you have a committee and you're trying to um, review these based upon our bylaws. And, and some of these you personally are for, you're personally against, but you have to think about it in terms of, you know, is this, is this related to science and science education and just science generally speaking in Kentucky. And that's a, that's a really hard thing to do. And um, you know, what, one thing that we've thought of is having a ranking system and we haven't done that yet, but uh, some of these bills are, you know, we're opposed to them, but they're, they would be ranked relatively low. Um, and some of them, the, 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 the emergencies, the ones that are ranked very high, uh, those are the ones that we would actually, you know, go to Frank. Well, it's probably more like a zoom call now, but in the past we've gone to Frankfurt and, and, you know, testified in front of a committee and said, you know, we, we're opposed to this bill on, you know, on behalf of Kentucky Academy of Science or Kentucky Science, Science Education, whatever the organization is, we're opposed or we support this bill because, and we have experts there, you know, doing the testifying. Uh, as far as, as bills that we strongly support or strongly oppose, uh, we're not finished yet <laughs> going through all of them, but uh, I'm sure there will be some before the, before the session is, is over. You know, we're, we're in the middle of this break uh, at the time this podcast is being recorded. Uh, the, the session starts back in early February and goes to mid March. So we're going to be watching these bills very closely and uh, taking action as appropriate. Fantastic. It's Kaylin. a good uh, resource that you're giving to people. Appreciate that. So, Kaylin, with the um, with the Kentucky Science Education, I know Trent talked about how uh, with the Kentucky Academy of Science, um, you don't have to be a scientist to be involved or to get engaged. Um, for KSE, how could if people wanted to get engaged or involved, what uh, what avenues are there for them? Well, anyone can be involved as long as they claim that they are a, a Kentuckian who is for science education. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's, that's pretty much it. Um, and when it comes to like membership, uh, if you go to our website, there's a link on the main page that'll take you to like fill out an interest form. And I'm like, awesome, because I get notification of those and then I can put you on my emails. Um, and you'll know when my meetings, my meetings, my, it's really, you're going to hear from me a lot because I'm going to send you things and ask <laughs> you to show up to things so I can get your opinion on things. Um, and, and really that's, that's like the membership. Your job is to keep us informed about your concerns. What are your, what's going on in your community and how can we help? Um, so, uh, I just try to navigate all that. Uh, and right now we're meeting, you know, every week or so you can attend the meetings if you want. Um, but it's, uh, it's an opportunity for us to work together on things. And so some of the things we've been working on, you know, we've been watching this, these items of legislation, um, and we're working on developing a platform. This is how we're going to try to keep track of which ones we can and cannot support. We're going to sit down and like, you know, what are the things that we can identify would affect the quality of science education in Kentucky? Um, and so anything that would, for example, uh, affect the actual content, that's clearly going to be something we respond to. Um, but it also could be things like disparities in um, kids' access to science education. Um, so anything that could affect it that way, anything that can affect our natural resources, anything that can affect research into education or into science, anything that would affect science industry because they often help partnership with the schools providing opportunities for science fairs. And uh, then we're, they, there's usually cooperations with the universities. And so there's these interrelated factors. Um, and so it, it gets a little difficult because you start to come across some of the things you're like, how is that exactly is that related to science education? 
Mm -hmm. And so we try to, we're going to try to outline all of our rationale and reason ahead of time so that when the legislation comes across, we're not going to be tempted to be like, yeah, we are definitely going to sign on for that, even though there's really not a way we can justify it. Um, because we as individuals might feel inclined um, to say something, but if it's not under the purview that we've already established, it, it kind of helps keep us in check. Um, so that's been a, that's something we're still working on creating. Um, and yeah, like, so I actually, um, I spent a year and a half serving as the director of legislative affairs for the National Association of Graduate Professional Students. Um, and so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, what legislation are we going to exert our energy in and prioritizing what's their likelihood of passing versus um, the, you know, is this, is this just a messaging bill that somebody mm -hmm. has put in there to tell their constituents that, hey, I am against this thing. Um, so uh, you, you're trying to parse that out, you know, yeah. it can be difficult. Um, we would always that, follow the rule of looking for how many of them have, like which ones have co-sponsors and then do they have a bill in both the House and the Senate? And that can kind of help guide you on those sorts of things. I think that's a really good point to bring out and the subtlety a lot of people um, may not appreciate is that often there are bills that are introduced that the legislators know they're not going to go anywhere. They're, yeah. they're never going to get voted on, but it's to make a statement of their position. And with the resources was, that most of our groups have, we can't spend a lot of energy on those things that we know that aren't going to go anywhere and need to focus on the things that may go somewhere. Right. That's a, that's a really good point. I was actually going to bring that up. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. There are a number of bills on here that would be great, I think, for science and, you know, environmental science, especially if you're, in, if you're interested in environmental science. Senate Bill 58, you mentioned, you, you know, asked about specific bills earlier, prohibits uh, the release of a certain amount of balloons, you know, establishes a ban on plastic bags, single-use plas plastic straws, and styrofoam. That would be great in an ideal world, but, you know, is that, is something like that actually going to pass in Kentucky? And, um, you know, you have other things like, uh, HB 107, a proposed constitutional amendment recognizing the right of people to have clean and healthy and healthy environment. You know, of course, of course, we're going to support something like that. It's just a, uh, just an amendment saying, you know, we, we have the right to have a clean, healthy air, water and, and all that sort of thing. But what are the likelihood of these of these things passing? You know, that that is something that uh, I think everybody has to take into account. Mm -hmm. But I still encourage everybody to call your legislator and, you know, tell them the bills that are important to you and the ones that you support, even if it's one that may not necessarily that may not necessarily pass or that you think your legislator, you know, is never going to be for. Um, it's still important for them to hear that they do have constituents in their in their districts that are for those things. And the more they hear of that the more likely it is that they may reconsider at some point down the line or understand that their constituents aren't just this monolith behind everything they say. And I would also say a key reason that you should be in contact with your legislators because the more they know you, even if it's just calling to say I support this or whatever, the more they can develop a relationship with you and the more they'll trust you when it comes to the really big important issues. And so if they know that you have been able to contact them and give them some, some you know, pretty good justification for what look like pretty reasonable, if not you know, hot topic issues, then whenever you call again, because they do keep track of these sorts of things, they'll know, okay, so this person like, I can trust them to be monitoring things, that they're not just going to call me because they were told to send to send a letter and they're all identical. And we know that some organization is, is just pushing people to call. And so when it comes across as genuine and authentic and as a real desire to communicate to, not yell at your <laughs> legislator, it does make a difference. Yeah, that's great. That's yep. great. All right. Well, I um, want to thank both of you for joining us today and uh, appreciate all you're doing for uh, science education in Kentucky. 
And uh, again, if our uh, listeners want to get involved, we'll put the links to the uh, Kentucky Academy of Sciences and Kentuckians for Science Education. We'll put those links on the podcast information. Um, thank you both for being with us. Appreciate it. Thanks so thank much. You. All right, and that's going to about wrap it up for this week on uh, Left in Kentucky. And um, we, uh, we have some good guests coming up here in the near future. Uh, we've got um, Representative Rachel Roberts next week. Yay! That's a great one. Yep. And uh, week after that, we've got Representative Buddy Wheatley. Love me some Buddy Wheatley. Yep. Yep, so good ones. Um, those are uh, Rach, Those are well. Rachel will be in the week, the Sunday before uh, we go back into session. Before the legislature goes back into session, so we'll look forward to see what she has coming up there. That should be very informative. Yes. Yep. So remember, um, make sure you're reaching out to your legislators. Call them. Call them, let them know what you like as well as what you don't like. Uh, bills that you're for and what you're not for. We'll have the uh, links to our the websites for our guests that we're on today. Uh, and thanks again to our guests. Yep. Great, you, great Trent. job. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, we appreciate you being on. And uh, until then, I guess we will talk to you next week. This is Roberto. This is Amy Ferguson. Have a good one. Yeah.